Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another Indie Game Friday, where each week I take a look at a different independent computer role-playing game. Every so often, I do like to take a look at a free game for people that are on a budget or just looking for something to kill time, and since the developer reached out to me on this one, I figured it'd be a good time to take a look at it. Ice Blink Engine Basic is a free-to-play offering and is available on PC, iOS, and Android. Although it has been in development for some time now, apparently the first post-beta release just hit this month in November 2021. Inspired by classics like the Gold Box series, but also the slightly more modern Neverwinter Nights to the point where it's hosted on the Neverwinter Vault, Ice Blink Engine is a turn-based, tile-based, retro-style RPG engine with modules that can be downloaded directly through the app and a creation toolkit that allows you to make your own. As such, I will be skipping even the brief look at storyline that I usually do since it is entirely based on the module you select, and concentrate on the gameplay and the presentation. When you start a game, Ice Blink Basic allows you to take a look at the news, comment on the app, and gives you options to play modules and to create them. Selecting play brings you to the module selection screen. This enables you to cycle through your installed modules or get a list of publicly available modules to download. While you can download a public module directly, you can also play modules that you've created or received from others who have the game. You can also leave and read comments on the module itself. Upon selecting the module, you're brought to the module title screen. You can start a new game, load a save game, check out the player's guide for the general game rules and information, and then check out the credits for that particular module. Creating a new game lets you add or remove characters from those you have created, as well as importing a character that you've made elsewhere, creating a new character anew, or just starting the game with any with a party in question. A module author can set the number of allowed player characters created and the allowed party members, so just how many you can actually create for a module may vary from 1 to 6, and some modules may have it so you only have pre-made characters to select from. The currently selected character's basic stats are listed on the bottom of the character selection screen, just for a quick review. Creating a character gives you a basic idea of the base stats that Ice Blink uses. It seems to be based on a D20 SRD with your basic six stats of Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma, an Ascending AC system, a base attack bonus, hit points, and then Fortitude, Reflex, and Will saves. Interestingly, the stat generation system is a random roll of 2d6 plus 6, which may be rolled however many times you wished. Now, this doesn't allow for too much fine customization since you can't switch stats, but you can just generally get above average stats across the board and just re-roll till you see something that you like. There is a spell point stat which diverges from the core SRD Vanshian system, indicating a spell point based magic system. Characters get a name, a race, a gender, and a class. The races available are the Human, Dwarf, Elf, Gnome, Halfling, and Half-Orc, and the classes include Cleric, Fighter, Paladin, Ranger, Thief, Wizard, and Druid. Once more, you can see the difference with the core D20 SRD, with the Thief replacing the Rogue and a few of the classes being restricted from some races. This lends a generally far more old-school feel to things. You may also select both a character icon, a la the Gold Box series, as well as a portrait. After initial class and race selection, you get to pick your traits. You can select a limited number of traits, which can vary between skills and what might be considered feats or class elements in other systems. You do have a limited number of traits, but may get more of them upon leveling up. If you picked a spellcasting class, you may also select spells in the next step. Once you enter the game, depending on the module, you might enter into a dialogue directly or onto the map itself. We'll assume that you're dropped right into the basic interface map, just to make things easy. The interface is cluttered, admittedly. It is dominated by the local area shown in tiles with the portraits of the party members listed along the top of the screen. In the upper right corner is by default a log of events and text, although if you toggle a minimap on it'll show up here as well, while below it are the movement arrows and the wait icon. To the left you have icons letting you access the party sheets, the party inventory, and the quest journal, the selected character's usable abilities slash traits, and then any spells the character class may cast. Below this is the save game icon, and then the utility icon. 
The utility icon opens a submenu across the bottom of the screen, letting you toggle various displays such as the minimap, character portraits, whether to show the whole party's icons on the screen, the grid, volume, full screen or bordered, a debug mode, and a general help icon that lets you mouse over things for assistance. When the party character sheet is open, you can review your character's stats, including the base stats I already covered, as well as your, their equipped items. Characters can equip an, a weapon, an offhand weapon or shield, armor, a helm, and up to two rings. You can also review the derived stats, their various attack bonuses and damage, their critical threat range and multiplier, their range and attack types, and various defenses. You can also review what effects a character is under, and you can change their displayed icon and portrait here at will. In terms of gameplay, it's very, very simple. Basic movement involves meandering around a map screen until you trigger events, combats, or transitions. Pretty much everything in the game is just a triggerable event of some sort. Conversations open a dialogue when you move on to them. Containers open a container dialogue when you move on to them. Transitions transition you to another map, and so forth. It makes for very simple exploration. It should be noted that some tiles are not flagged as walkable, limiting your movement appropriately, and some block your line of sight entirely, which is set based on the map's overall settings. When you enter combat, combat takes place in a separate sub-map generally. Initiative is rolled and your characters and the enemy are displayed on the new map. The options change to add the ability to skip the turn, move, and attack, and the display options let you toggle, showing hit points, dice rolls, move order, and so forth. To fight, you can maneuver around the map and move on to enemies to trigger a melee attack. Targeting an enemy within a ranged weapon can be done by selecting the attack button and then targeting them, although they must be in range and in line of sight. Using a skill or trait can be useful for melee characters, with some combat actions being described as traits, while spells may be targeted similarly to ranged weapons. Combat proceeds until one side or the other is defeated, after each combat and after certain quests, you may gain experience which allows you to level up at any time. This grants you some increases in hit points and base attack as appropriate, and you may gain access to additional traits and spell selections depending on your class. So overall, for playing a module, that's what you're presented with. It's extremely basic, but this basic functionality can cover a wide variety of adventures. It should be noted that there's a few optional systems, such as a rations and limited rest, that can be put into certain modules or on certain maps that the module's designers wishes. On towards creating a module, instead of selecting play from the main screen, you simply select create. This lets you either load an existing module, which can be useful to see how they work, or create a new one. When you create a new module, you name it on the spot and may then review your module settings. You can select whether your module is publicly available, its name, and its label. You can write a basic description, write what appears in the credits and other notes, add some default player characters if you want the player to play particular ones, note the module's version, starting area, and starting location within the starting area. You may select a title for use on the title screen and the uh, module's start time, whether to use an optional ration system, figure out player's party size and how many player characters can be included, and a starting goal. In the lower left is the menu toggle, which opens the left and bottom menus up. The left menu allows you to create and edit maps, encounters, dialogues, containers, merchants, and journal slash quest entries, each of which opens its own editor, including things like a tile-based map editor or a branching dialogue editor. Along the bottom, you have your ability to save the module, adjust settings, edit and create new creatures, edit and create new items, edit and create new player characters, and edit art to create new tiles, sprites, and so forth. The map editor allows you to craft different maps of different tile sizes with multiple layers to allow for the placement of various events, encounters, and icons to represent them. The encounter editor allows you to open up its own map and place various creatures upon it. This is where you get the sub-map when you get an encounter. Editing containers and stores allows you to place what you wish the characters to recover or purchase individually, while editing characters, items, and creatures lets you customize the details and the stats of that particular item, creature, etc., either to duplicate ones from tabletop or create entirely new ones as you wish. Each of these editors is very basic, but they are robust enough, especially taken together, that with some effort you can craft a very in-depth adventure given enough time. The capabilities of Ice Blink are fairly decent for creating and player and customized modules of a very old-school style of design, but let's take a look at the presentation. There are a few included sound effects, and the included artwork is a mix of old-school Goldbox-style pixel art or art from old TSR and General Fantasy artworks. I can believe you uh, can actually import your 
own art into modules as need be, so I can't really comment on the basic graphic makeup of Ice Blink. It's extremely patchwork and could do with some inclusion of some public domain graphic collections or custom art and tiles geared towards a more cohesive look and feel, but I can't really say that's a complete solution, since then you'd end up with something like with RPG Maker, where most games end up looking identical. I also count too much against the developer on this count, since it is a free product from a tiny developer, and honestly, the ability to include your own art and modules means that a lot of the look and feel of individual modules is going to be up to how creative the module creator feels. Now, I've seen some of the included modules. Uh, some of them range from incredibly basic, but some of them do quite a, a decent job with what limited abilities that they have, and... You know, that that's uh, actually kind of basically on to them. Uh, I uh, also would say that if this was ever polished up for a paid release, I would definitely want to see the portraits taken from old fantasy material placed by something, you know, anything just to avoid potential issues, because I would not want to see, you know, that, that crop up. Also, since this is a both a desktop and a mobile app, the interface is cluttered to an almost absurd degree. The plethora of icon-based menus is derived from this need to offer functionality to touch-based screens. Although I kind of actually like the look of the old-school retro icons and interface, it could use some general cleanup organization and polish. I get that the clutter is going to remain a problem because of the mobile issue, but I found that the overall clutter did impact my time and ability to play both the modules and create them. It made it counterintuitive in many instances, and not to an absurd degree, but it was noticeable. It impacted my experience. As for gameplay within the modules, it was actually much like a simplified and actually streamlined uh, version of the old Gold Box games. I did encounter a few bugs within combat, mostly having to do with downed characters repeatedly triggering attacks of opportunity when they shouldn't, and some other interactions with movements and other things. It would have been nice to see some of the more obvious hotkeys for end of turn and things like that for those of us who play primarily with a keyboard. A lot of it is geared towards either mouse or touchscreen. But other than that, I had no complaints over it. It was actually pretty decent. This sort of hybrid of third edition S S SRD mechanics with old school class limits made for a very familiar sort of combat and leveling system. And as a long time D&D player, I did appreciate that choice. I have to say that it was rather well implemented all in all. Perhaps not the best SRD implementation I've ever seen, but, but it, was, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. So overall, what do I think about Ice Blink Basic? Well, it is an interesting way to make and play modules reminiscent of the old Gold Box games, so using a tool set similar to Neverwinter Nights, or perhaps I should say more appropriately, a tool set uh, similar to the old Unlimited Adventures product. As a free-to-play product from a small developer, it's pretty good all in all, hindered mostly by a cluttered interface subject to its mobile release origins and a slightly clunky user experience. I feel like it could be having some continued polish going forward, and it's, that, that part is important, because this is a module-based nature. Uh, this is a, a module-based product, and... It relies thus on a community building modules for it. And although there is always a place for decent gameplay and writing over look and feel, if the user interface is slightly adjusted to be a bit more intuitive, this would very much help with the accumulation of players and, more importantly, more module authors. To be honest, if the artwork and interface issues were worked on a bit, if the module creation and sharing were made a little bit more intuitive, I could easily see Ice Blink being able to offer a nice pay-to-play version on Steam or an App Store for a couple bucks. Yeah, maybe not like 20 or 30, but like, you know, three to five bucks, that adds up pretty quick. I enjoyed my time with it. As an, as an aside, I actually realized during my look here that I actually had Ice Blink installed on an old Android device, I think, from a couple of years ago. I've actually played this game before. Uh, the improvements made since then were actually very noticeable, which shows how the developer has worked on this project to define it over time. I, for one, look forward to seeing where it goes from here. And on that note, I'm going to wrap it up here. This has been the RPG Crawler with Indie Game Friday, Ice Blink Basic. I'll put a link to the site, which then itself has links to where you can get it below. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you've got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content, both tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye. 
And if you are still watching, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my supporters, the top tiers of which are listed on the screen, without whose support I would not have been able to offer the variety of content that I have on this channel throughout the years. If you're feeling particularly generous and would like to join them, you can support the channel. Uh, there are a variety of options to do so. I have a Patreon, a Subscribestar, as well as channel memberships enabled. If you are not in a position to contribute, simply leaving a like, a comment, or sharing my videos are all wonderful ways to help the channel grow without spending a dime and are all greatly appreciated. 